Wow, that Y2K video is not doing well. Oh well, I've got this political compass video coming up next, and I've got a secret weapon for success. Jeez, what the hell's going on over there? Hey, Tristan, have you heard about the Ancient Apocalypse? Hey, Tristan, have you heard about Ancient Apocalypse? Hey, Tristan, have you heard about Ancient Apocalypse? Weird. All right. How's it going? How's it going? Ready to make a Ready podcast? Ready to record? Yeah, let's make a podcast. Excellent, excellent. Uh, actually, before we... Have you heard of uh, this ancient that ancient apocalypse show? It's the show, right? <laughs> Sorry. All right. Let's do this. I've been arguing that there was a massive global cataclysm about 12,500 years ago that wiped out almost all traces. We're left with these haunting memories. Oh, God. This show is awful. I'm going to have so much fun. like I'm Geralt of Rivia or something. Mm. Those taste very bad. Ah. All right. Let's talk about Ancient Apocalypse. Oh. All right. Episode by episode. Let's do this. Episode one. Here we go. So the first stop in Ancient Apocalypse is Indonesia to a site called Gunung Padang. This structure is a massive natural hill that has five terraces that have been artificially made into it and was built somewhere in the first or second century CE. Or that's at least what they want you to think. So most of Graham Hancock's work comes from a guy by the name of Danny Hillman Natawajaja. I'm gonna go with that. It's already Indonesians. So Hillman is a geologist who is an expert in earthquakes and got a lot of his data using ground penetrating radar. First thing to note, first red flag, not, not an archeologist. So not trained in anything about the proper way to excavate or determine what a site is or isn't. And his major argument is that the site is not only a lot older than they're claiming, saying that it is nine to 20,000 years old, which would have it being built near the end of the last ice age, but also that it is full of cavities that implies that the entire structure is artificial. What Hancock doesn't talk about in Ancient Apocalypse is that, yes, the ground penetrating radar does show that there are uh, pockets of different types of density. What we would call chambers in the sense that he's talking about Maybe not so much. What we're seeing here is something that's very consistent with a volcanic hill, which is exactly what it is. But ground penetrating radar can't really tell you if a place is completely empty and full of air. The only way to really tell would be to dig. But as a volcanic hill, it's not unreasonable for it to have tubes, chambers, and all sorts of other things because of how it was formed. The other leg of Hillman's research involves a lot of radiocarbon dating that he claims he's done, but uh, after repeated requests to submit this, you know, this dating that shows that it's way older than we anticipate, it never gets published. He never seems to ever want to, you know, put forward this data he's collected apparently. But other people have done carbon dating at the site and shows that it's pretty clearly a volcanic hill and not a man-made structure. And there is archeological evidence at the site that shows about 9,000 BC or so that there was people they did have like rudimentary bone and stone tools, but nothing close to what would be needed to do to shape the stones and build such a massive mound. But this is where things get dangerous, is that while this doesn't have much basis in evidence, it is very, very appealing to nationalists. And Hillman's research has been picked up by people like the president of Indonesia and given a bunch of resources in order to uh, push that sort of narrative because it looks good to see that Indonesia was built on top of a ancient, super advanced civilization. He then goes over to the Federated States of Micronesia to a site called Nan Madal, 
which is basically like the Venice of Micronesia. It's the ruins of a city built in a bunch of canals. And Hancock's claim is that this was built a long, long, long time ago. And that the reason that it's a canal city is because the water, the ocean rose when the ice age ended. The problem though, is that they have a reasonably good idea of how it was built because there's an oral tradition that goes back that talks about them building it. And a, and a lot of archeological evidence showing that ancestors of the modern day Pompeians built it about a thousand years ago. The other aspect that Graham Hancock tries to use to convince you that this is artificial is he looks at the stones and claims that they were artificially cut. This is called columnar basalt and it does break off that way. It does look artificial, but it is basically the result of lava and water meeting each other. It's a geological process called columnar jointal volcanics. It's a geological process called columnar jointal volcanics. Um, I hope I said that right. What? Columnar jointed volcanics. It looks like it's artificial, but it is very natural and we have a pretty good idea of how it works and it shows up in multiple other places around the world. It's what happens when volcanic material hits water and solidifies into columns. They tend to look circular or hexagonal in nature and that's exactly what we see at these two sites. That's because when lava cools, it cracks and deforms in very predictable ways. So while it does look artificial, it does have a natural process and we've seen it in places like Devil's Tower, Giant's Causeway, Sunkyo Gorge, The Deccan Traps, High Island Reservoir, and Cavan Bacon. Or these columns that were found on the surface of Mars. But we'll get to Graham Hancock and Mars later. But the cornerstone of Graham Hancock's argument that these were built in the past when the sea level was lower comes from finding these columns under the water. And it makes sense that these columns would show up underwater because that's where they form. <laughs> and he also tries to claim, well, we see in Micronesia, they're building with this style of cut stone. And over in Indonesia, there's this same thing, which implies that there's a common civilization between the two. But what we're seeing here is that they had access to the same materials, so they built with similar materials. They did not need to be connected to each other. And the death knell is that we have archeological evidence of the builders of Nanmadal, including physical evidence, and the DNA of those people does seem to match the modern day people of the region. He also then tries to make this claim of the rising sea levels being the case for uh, stories around the world of biblical floods, but this is, a, a global flood, you know, Noah's flood style is a physical impossibility. We'll get to that a little bit later. But um, the main thing is like everybody's lived next to rivers. We Most of our early uh, settled civilizations lived close to rivers. Rivers have played a huge part in human civilization. And rivers flood, floods do happen. And if you are in a situation where you have limited contact with other people and there's a massive flood, you might think that the whole world has flooded. It might look that way, or it might have developed to make a more and more dramatic story as the story of the big flood becomes a legend that's passed down generation to generation. There's way better explanations for why so many civilizations have a global flood myth than there was an actual global flood. It's also very convenient that all of the smoking gun perfect evidence for Graham Hancock's case is just underwater where we can't get it. Super cool. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, that's episode one. Not bad. Let's see what episode two has in store. All right, so let's get into episode two in which we go full uh, Mexico mode, basically. Uh, we start with the uh, Pyramid of Cholula, which is interestingly, and pointed out in the show, the largest pyramid by size, by mass, or by volume, by girth. It's, it's, a, it's not the tallest, but it is the, the, the thickest, the chunkiest. And I don't want to go too super, super deep into the Cholula Pyramid because I did an entire episode of It's Probably Not Aliens about it. But to be said, things start off on a bad foot. Graham Hancock says at the beginning of episode two of Ancient Apocalypse that most people or that a lot of people think that Cholula is actually a natural hill formation, but the wise people really know that there's a bunch of uh, temples and pyramids built underneath. This is a thing that literally nobody believes. I can't find a single person who has made the argument that the Pyramid of Cholula is 
a natural hill. It seems to be a thing that has been uh, posited in the University of Graham Hancock's ass. There are lots of signs, even though it is a little bit overgrown, that the pyramid is indeed a pyramid. The Mexicans built the church on top of the Cholula Pyramid intentionally as a sign to impose Christian dominion over the former pagan temple. Because it was, and still is, a highly revered site by the Cholulan people. It's still to uh, indigenous people in Cholula used as a place of worship because it's one of the main temples to the uh, Mesoamerican god Tlaloc. Tlaloc being the god of rain and harvests and one of the most important deities in all of Mexico. Probably the most famous or second most famous Mesoamerican empire, the Aztec Empire, worshipped Tlaloc on equal footing with their main deity, Huitzilopochtli, who was the Aztec war god. And you can imagine any god worshipped by the Aztecs on the same level as their god of war is pretty important. Hancock then goes on to try to make this extremely hacky claim, and he even sort of admits it's kind of hacky, where he tries to say that, uh, and the Ancient Aliens does this a lot too, tries to make the claim that pyramids because so many different civilizations in so many different places, you know, in Egypt and Cambodia and even here in the Americas, that pyramids seem to show up independently in many different places, which is just evidence that all of them have influence from a very specific culture in all of their shared histories. This is another unfact from uh, Graham Hancock, but he tries to preempt it because the main argument is that no, that's not how it works. Uh, the reason why all of these different civilizations developed very different um, sort of processes for building pyramids, but why the sort of pyramidal shape came into existence is because before you have stainless steel or steel girders or any of the things that were needed to make our high-rise buildings that we have today, you really couldn't make a building over about three stories without it being too unwieldy or uh, basically impossible to stay upright. It'd be too uh, wobbly. The only way that you could actually build something that was over about maybe 30, 40 feet tall is if you made it have a large and wide enough base that it could be stable. Like, say, a pyramid. <laughs> Plus, they might have taken inspiration from forms seen in nature, like hills, for example. <laughs> so trying to preempt this point, he then goes on to try to make another thing of connection, which is that all of these ancient civilizations seem to also share this deep connection with astrology and the stars and a sort of intimate knowledge of the patterns of the planets and the stars and everything like that. But here's the thing, most civilizations in history have some sort of deep connection with the stars and planets. That's because in the times before meteorology, uh, when you are a agricultural civilization or even a foraging civilization, your life is deeply tied to the status of the weather and the seasons. So understanding the way that the seasons change is very important for understanding how to do proper crop rotations and establish basically your food base so that you can, say, eat in the wintertime without, you know, trying to grow crops in December. And in many civilizations, the idea that you can predict the seasons using the stars and planets just develops into, you know, when you have a pre-scientific idea of what the stars and planets are, you develop a belief system that is about how the stars and planets can predict all sorts of things. And when specifically talking about Mesoamerican people, Graham Hancock has in the past uh, made very disparaging remarks, you know, calling them too primitive to be able to develop certain forms of technology, specifically the Maya people. The Maya people had an extremely complex system of calendars and astrology that was core to their culture because uh, in Mesoamerica, the El Nino effect means that uh, weather can be very extreme and uh, using the stars to try and predict things like the uh, intense weather or things like droughts and things like that were a really, really big deal. And so they developed it into a very big and precise uh, uh, form of understanding the world. It became core to their spiritual worldview. But Graham Hancock came to the conclusion that well, they were obviously way too primitive to have figured this out on their own, so it must have been Atlanta. Hancock then goes into this animated story time about how the indigenous people of Cholula believed that such a large pyramid was obviously built by giants to 
give the idea that somehow through analysis of these myths, that these giants are now somehow people, intellectual giants uh, from the past who directed them to learn how to build these pyramids, not understanding that uh, a lot of the people in Mesoamerica did not know how to write and oral traditions have an interesting habit of changing and turning into more and more provocative stories. There's also another site not too far from Mexico City called Teotihuacan that had also a myth that giants had built it. Uh, the Aztecs believed that Teotihuacan was built at the basically beginning of the fourth world. That is the world that we currently live in, in their cosmology. And also believed that giants had put together the Temple of the Sun and the Moon. But importantly, archeology span at Cholula and at Teotihuacan have unearthed that there were many layers of civilization on this site and the construction of them is very uh, progressive. The reason why Cholula is so big wasn't because of some mega project that someone thought up. It was built up over, over a thousand years of uh, subsequent temples and then building temples on top of the temples. So then we see a little bit of Ancient Apocalypse's deceptive editing where Hancock does this very highly and suspiciously edited interview with an archaeologist by the name of Jeffrey McCafferty. And from what I can figure out, he's an actual legitimate uh, archaeologist who um, has a really deep passion for Cholula. And the way that he talks about it, like basically the back and forth is like, wow, this is a very big temple. And the guy's like, yep. And the way that it's like it's written and implied is that, well, mainstream archaeology just thinks this is a natural hill. But like me and Jeffrey, who also 100% believes the things I believe, say otherwise and show all these temples. And then sort of implies there's a whole lot of things left to excavate because that is true. The people at Cholula are having a lot of trouble uh, excavating the site because there's a lot of complicated stuff with the fact that it's a whole hill or the pyramid has kind of grown into a hill and then has a church on top of it, which is also a heritage site for Mexicans. So very complex political situation and also uh, excavating a pyramid when you have a building on top of the overgrowth on top of it is always going to be a complex situation because doing anything underground is hard. So uh, then Hancock basically is like, oh, there's probably a lot more to discover. And then, uh, you know, McCafferty's like, yeah, there's so much that hasn't been excavated yet. There's obviously like we there's a whole bunch of stuff that we don't know. And he uses that open-ended way of talking to, and then cuts, like, like cuts very quickly before he can explain himself in any meaningful fashion to sort of make the uh, implication that this guy is agreeing with Hancock's whole claim, which is apparently that Cholula, the pyramid, uh, was built by ancient people tens of thousands of years before the time that we actually have, you know, evidence and dates to show when it was built and instead based on his vibes based reasoning uh thinks that this is all um you know building towards this huge thing this is called deceptive editing when you take somebody like McCafferty who is very excited in exploring and unearthing more about the site and they say something like one of the former archaeologists found somewhere inside the pyramid um an open room and there were tunnels leading into it it's never been published I don't know what the Current situation is well. Has that has that room ever been excavated? Has it ever been revisited? Not that I know of. I grab her. We can. Oh, so Mr. Simpson, you admit you grabbed her can. But you don't let them contextualize what they're saying or elaborate on what they're saying, but just sort of build on your own claim. That is something that is far and against uh, what any archaeologist who actually knows what they're doing would say, that makes a connection that's not necessarily there. We then go to Texcotzingo, which is a site about 20 miles away from Mexico City, and meets up with a guy named uh, Marco Fitago, who we'll talk about a little bit later in the video. But basically, they go to the site and they talk about the archaeological understanding of the site, which is that during a, it's a more recent site that it was built as a uh, wonderful hanging garden by the uh, the current uh, Tlatuani of the time. So they go through like, you know, the established archaeology and that people have a pretty good idea. They've studied the site. This is another archaeological site in Mexico of many that have had a lot of documentation and study. And yeah, that's the idea. That's when it was built. But then they say, well, this is clearly 
a lot older. This was almost certainly a pre-Aztec site. Mm -hmm. It was simply reoccupied and reused. That, that's it. That's that. This is the problem with uh, ancient apocalypse. Is very often it's like, how do you respond to looks older? Like, what? Their entire argument comes down to the fact that the site's made out of a type of granite that looks to them, based on their, you know, again, vibes-based reasoning of the world, looks to them like it's way older than a site that uh, that wouldn't have that. They make some references to some granite sites in a different place that has an extremely different climate and has been uh, given a extremely different amount of love and care because they're in Europe, and, and then says, well, look, this one is the same age, but it's not weathered, despite the fact that it's been, you know, maintained and lovingly taken care of, versus this place that belongs to the Aztecs and was abandoned for several centuries. And because this one looks more weathered, obviously it must be much older. And that is their entire argument. It's like, I don't even know how to respond to this. It's just, oh, looks older than me. And they strain so far from what I would call the null hypothesis, the idea that you look at something, and if something, if if these like you know weathered granite blocks did stick out, uh, archaeologists would be very interested in something like that because you know finding out that a site is a lot older than it actually is is a real feather in the cap of any archaeologist who discovers that. When you're looking into stuff like that, you should probably investigate other types of explanations. Could it be that the sites you're comparing it to might have been cared differently? Could it be that granite? no matter how hard it is, when it is abandoned in a region like Tetzcoatzingo for four centuries, that maybe it's going to show some wear and tear. Or the fact that it was a hanging garden means that there was a lot of water there, and water tends to be very destructive to any stone that's near it, granite included. They also do a little bit about the site of Xochicalco, specifically talking about the feathered serpent, which is an image that shows up a lot. This is a sort of somewhere between a hero and a god, like sort of like a Hercules type figure that shows up a lot in Mesoamerican mythology. Uh, in Southern Mexico, in the Yucatan, it goes by the name of Cococan. Uh, in the sort of central and northern parts of Mexico, like kind of near Mexico City, it goes by the name of Quetzalcoatl. And I'll get a little bit more into this later, but I want to make sure that I don't forget that the reason why they're very intent on making you know about Quetzalcoatl is because there's a famous myth that the Aztecs believe that the Spaniards were the return of Quetzalcoatl because Quetzalcoatl left over uh, the eastern horizon when uh, he left in the sort of main mythology and said that he would come back someday um, because the cardinal directions are very important to the Aztecs. I'm getting ahead of myself here. But the general mythology is that uh, Quetzalcoatl is this like, you know, bright white figure. And the myth is that he had a beard. And uh, what... My phone's down here as my notes. But what Graham Hancock is not saying is that this belief, uh, this Atlantis belief that he's trying to not say Atlantis, uh, but this whole thing he's trying to build is this argument that the ancient civilization that inspired all of the great works of humanity was done by figures that had white skin and beards, which... Um, yeah, we'll get into that a little bit later. Put a pin in that. But that's basically this episode. There's a few deceptive edits. There's a few lies. And then there's just a lot of Graham Hancock going to amazing archaeological sites and then saying, well, my vibe is that this is very different than what uh, over a century of archaeology has said. Anyways, that's all. Let's move on to episode three. All right. Episode three. This is the one where they went to Malta. Um, this is an eagle, obviously. But uh, I, my thought was... Maltese falcon bird? Roll with me here. I'm very limited on props. So let me try to summarize what's going on in Malta in Ancient Apocalypse. The entirety of episode three is focused on it, but the general consensus of archaeologists is that these uh, constructs that are found throughout uh, Malta are old, but they're like 5,000, 4,000 years old, which, you know, maps very well onto our established idea of when people first arrived in Malta and all sorts of stuff like that. But there's one cave found in Malta that has a tooth that is believed, not confirmed, to have belonged to a member of the Neanderthals, who were a hominid cousin of humans. And that tooth dates back to the previous Ice Age at a time when, because water levels were lower than they are today, Malta was still connected to the mainland of Europe. So his claim is that these temples and constructs were 
actually built because of the tooth in the cave, way older than, you know, five, four thousand years ago, but more like 20,000 years ago. And his main argument besides tooth is precisely because they're not pointed at the star that he says they are. So he makes this whole big deal about the, the Sirius star, which has been important in various cultures during times, because we've talked about just earlier that stars and everything play a big role. But these don't point at the same star. And I find this, this is the, this is the funniest, one of the funniest arguments that Graham Hancock makes. So he's trying to say that all of these buildings point at Sirius. And that is the reason why he knows that they're all uh, built older because they're all built to face Sirius at a time when because of stellar drift, because of the whole um, procession of the equinoxes, it, it, star stuff. So but, but I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but basically over a period of thousands of years, the place where all of the constellations are starts to move slowly. This is why actually right now, all of the zodiacs, all of the signs of the zodiacs are now a full constellation off. And there's actually a 13th zodiac now. Um, but the zodiacs that we use, and because people are gonna ask, Sagittarius. So during my birthday, November 27th, when the sun rose into the sky in ancient Zoroastrian times, the sun passed the constellation Sagittarius. That doesn't ex that doesn't happen anymore. It now goes over a completely different time because of the procession of the equinoxes. Now, uh, it passes over a completely different one, probably. Capricorn or something. I don't know. I don't really know the Zodiac super well. So this is a vibe based on a vibe because he's then like, okay, all of these are pointing at Sirius, obviously, because nothing else could possibly mean uh, pointing in that direction. But the problem is that they don't. They don't all point in that direction. So he makes the argument, he's like, actually, that the fact that they don't point at Sirius proves that they do point at Sirius because 20,000 years ago, some of them might have pointed at Sirius and other ones, the other ones that didn't, they were built later so that they did at a different time. <laughs> and also to dismiss the mainstream archeological interpretation of who built sites like Gigantica uh, is to say that the people who lived there 5,000 years ago were too dumb and primitive to have built something like that. Are you noticing a pattern here? Again, we also see deceptive editing Part of the episode involves an interview with a woman by the name of Katya Strout, who is involved with Heritage Malta, who when Ancient Apocalypse actually aired, had to do an entire Facebook post about how her interview was deceptively edited and she was taken out of context in order to push a narrative that she very much does not believe in. Now, the major argument that Graham Hancock uses to say that these buildings weren't built in the way that established archaeology says is because there's no learning curve. There's no smaller buildings leading to bigger buildings leading to bigger buildings leading to uh, the ones they have here. Can these primitive farmers who can't build anything bigger than a shack actually build something like Gigantica? The problem though is that like a lot of the times with Graham Hancock, he takes these cinematic videos of these very impressive sites and then says, look, without any context, how could anybody have built this? Nobody knows. There's no there's no lead up to this. How could you say this? And then, you know, the archaeologists say, well, no, there is a build up to it. And the build up is often at the site itself. What Hancock doesn't seem to want to acknowledge is that a lot of these major temple complexes that he claims are, you know, far too advanced to be built by people who only built huts, uh, actually began rather modestly and were expanded over thousands of years. It turns out that when you have thousands of years to improve and build on something, which also sounds a lot like Cholula, doesn't it? You can actually end up with some pretty uh, impressive sites and you can see the processes as they expanded onto these sites, the, them learning different techniques and advancing. The problem though is that if you're entering with a preconceived notion and you're not interested in uh, actually studying the context and actually having a deep, uh, understanding, a nuanced understanding of Malta, like, uh, you know, archaeologists who dedicate their entire lives to studying these sites do, then yeah, you could just say, oh, that's weird. All right. Well, that proves the theory that I'm keep trying to harp on. Bye. And as far as Gar Dalam goes, which is the cave that is mentioned that has the Neanderthal tooth found in it, his story is a little bit more complicated than that. Heritage Malta is doing a study on that since they collected the tooth in 2016. And while Hancock is making a bunch of preconceived conclusions based on just the discovery of one object, Heritage Malta 
is taking a much more nuanced approach because, you know, they're experts and care about understanding what is actually going on. What's happened is that, yes, these were collected in 2016, but research is still ongoing as to how it got there, what its condition was, and what it means about the history of Malta. That study hasn't been published yet. They're still working on it because archaeology takes a long time to sift and study and research. So essentially what Graham Hancock is doing is the equivalent of taking an experiment that just happens and talking about it before the paper's even written, which anybody who knows anything about the way that science works is an extremely irresponsible way to approach things. He hasn't even given mainstream archeology span a chance to say anything about this site or this artifact before he is establishing a bunch of stuff, again, uh, prepared from the University of Graham Hancock's ass, in order to fit this preconceived narrative that he has, which I just want to repeat for every single episode because he doesn't like to say it in the show, Atlantis. And to kind of finish up to talk a little bit about Sirius, because what he's doing is that Graham Hancock's theories over the 30 years he's been writing have been connected with other conspiracy movements. And to especially put attention on Sirius is to give some credence or some connection at least with other people in his space, like the people who believe in star seed theory, which is the idea that a bunch of cultures in our past were influenced by aliens from Sirius. It's also used to erase a lot of the developments by people like the Hopi and the Zuni, as well as in Africa with groups like the Dogon people. You find out a lot about it in another show that has about an equal amount of credibility as Ancient Apocalypse, which is the History Channel show Ancient Aliens. There is no logical explanation for why the Dogon tribe knew about the Sirius star system naturally. We didn't have telescopes in those days. How did they know this? It's as if an ET came here and just told them all about that. There's a whole episode of It's Probably Not Aliens called The Dogon People Are Serious Business. I recommend you check it out. All right, episode four. In a powerful start to episode four, he goes on this long rant about his Wikipedia article because it labels him a pseudo-archaeologist, you know, because Wikipedia is pretty accurate about a lot of things. And I can only reserve the sort of vitriol and style to something posted on Facebook on the topic of fake friends. If you look me up on Wikipedia, you'll find that I'm described as a pseudo-archaeologist or a pseudo-scientist. I find this frankly absurd. I'm no more a pseudo-scientist than a dolphin is a pseudo-fish. Like for a multi-million dollar Netflix documentary, he's airing out his grievances like it's some vlog. It's very strange. He then gets into the meat of the episode, which actually doesn't present a whole lot of arguments. If anything, he just presents a whole lot of negative arguments, saying there are a lot of things that aren't there and therefore something else is there. It's a very weak line of reasoning, but he begins with something called the Bimini Road. It is a favorite of pseudo-archaeologists and uh, plays well into this genre of things where people don't understand what rock formations are and don't really get how tectonics and the way that stones break can look almost like they're artificial, but they're not. It's like they're artificial, but they're not. Everybody's so creative. The most famous version of this is the Yonaguni Monument over in Japan. I did a whole episode of IPNA about it. I really gotta stop harping on my own podcast, but Ancient Aliens talked about it quite a bit. and. In this case, he's going to the Bahamas and talking about the Bimini Road, which is a line of stones that have broken in a fashion where it almost looks artificial. It doesn't really look artificial. He makes it out to be more uh, artificial looking than it actually is. But what the Bimini Road is, is about a one kilometer long stone formation that has a lot of regular breaks that make uh, a relatively straight line. It was discovered in 1968 and pseudo-archaeologists have been claiming that it might be a road or a building or a wall or a breakwater or all sorts of different things. To the point where when doing research for this video, I looked up what locals were saying about it and even tourism websites about the Bahamas listed as possible remnants of the lost city of Atlantis. But is there any evidence that the Bimini Road is indeed an artificial structure from very ancient times? And the answer is... 
No, no, there isn't actually any at all. It's a completely natural rock formation. And of all of the prominent names of people who claim that the Bimini Road is artificial, none of them are archaeologists, the experts in this exact type of thing. But given the sort of conspiratorial setup, that Graham Hancock establishes throughout this show, he sort of preempts this criticism that anybody who actually knows what they're talking about, who looks at it, concludes pretty, pretty quickly, actually, that it is a natural structure. To the point where it hasn't really been studied all that hard since a few years after it was discovered, because after having a look at it, it became clear very quickly that it was basically a uh, rock formation. <laughs> and what is a reason why these people believe that it is a natural formation? Well, because... We've seen lots of these in the past. It's actually a normal part of geology. If you have sedimentary rock, which is, you know, rock made from things um, sed sedimenting on things. So basically you have like rocks that have lots of layers. If you've ever been to the American Southwest, I'll, I'll show a picture right now. You can see that there are lots of rock that have layers on top of those. And rock that develops in this way has different levels of density. Imagine like a seven layer dip made of stone, right? And in different periods in Earth's history, different types of sedimentary rock go onto each other. You know, at one point the region was dry, so maybe it's sandstone. At one point it might be underwater, so it's limestone or uh, some sort of mudstone or something like that. And these rocks have different types of densities. So when one breaks, like say through tectonics or through erosion or something like that, what'll happen is that one layer might crack or crumble, but the layer underneath won't. So what you end up seeing is something that looks like uh, stone blocks being uh, cracked apart. And also, as I said, Graham Hancock tries to make the argument that it looks really regular and that it looks artificial when the, the claims of it being artificial are very exaggerated, and there are big uh, variations in the size of these stones that make up the road, or how deep they go, or all sorts of things like that. It's just like other rock formations, like at Yonaguni, but also another good case is at Eagle Hawk Neck in Tasmania, and I'll put a picture on the screen of Eagle Hawk Neck to show. And this is a type of formation that, while it's, you know, uncommon, it's not unexplainable. But he then goes on to look at the Bimini Shark Mound, where he looks at it and shows like, oh, like the Nazca Lines, these can only be seen from the sky. He tries really hard to not imply aliens here. Hancock then goes in to say that archaeologists haven't studied this site, and as far as my research shows, he's not wrong on that, but that uh, people in ancient times also feared sharks and would have known about them and would have made something like this. And so it had to have been uh, ancient Atlanteans who made this mound. And my answer to that is, um, why? Why though? His main argument comes from oral tradition, which I respect that says that when they came here, they saw that. But oral tradition can be murky, especially when you go very far back. And I'm not even making the argument that it's not artificial because it could well be artificial. It looks like a shark. Uh, it could be natural and we're just, you know, putting our images on it, but that, you know, study would be needed, obviously, to come to the conclusion on that. But there is no reason to say that indigenous people didn't make this mound. It was perfectly within their capabilities. And even if the current people living in the Bahamas or in Bimini itself say that this uh, was there before they arrived, it could have been a different group of indigenous people who lived there before the current inhabitants. And there's a reason why he's using so many weasel words and sort of uh, vague inferences, and that is because he's trying to dance around that he believes that the people, the indigenous people of Bimini, are too primitive to have been able to make something as complicated as a mound shaped like a shark. And also to dance around the fact that his evidence is, again, vibes-based. And of course, racism, but we'll get to that later. Let's start with with this one, which is a very famous map. This is the Piri Reis map. So the Piri Reis map is a staple of crank archeology. span It's an ancient map that comes from the early 16th century, which if you look at it, does seem to show the coast of Antarctica, a place that had not been discovered by humans until the 1800s. But yet here it is on this Ottoman map made in 1513 by an Ottoman cartographer by the name of Piri Reis. So why is the Piri Reis map important in the history of maps? 
Well, the main reason is that it's one of the few artifacts we have that shows the state of exploration of the New World in 1510. Other thing is that Piri Reis, uh, like many cartographers, based the map off of other maps by copying off of other maps. And what we do know is that this map has uh, in it stuff that has been copied from the maps made by Christopher Columbus. And Christopher Columbus's original maps and writings don't exist anymore. So this is the closest thing we have to a map that actually has information put down by Christopher Columbus. Christopher Columbus was an evil, evil man, but undoubtedly a important uh, figure for understanding the history of the Age of Exploration. It's also the only 16th century map that shows some important features of South America. The map was such a big deal that uh, the Turks actually at one point put it on their uh, 1 million lira note. I don't know if you can... I don't know if you can see that, but uh, that is right there. That is the Piri Reis map on the money because, um, well, my wife got this for me for Christmas. So I, I wanted to make sure it got into the video so you guys could see this cool present I got. So for you map nerds out there, and I know on Step Back, there's a lot of you. This is a Portolan map, uh, which is used for uh, navigation and is primarily important for its accuracy. You know, this is the kind of thing that navigators use to, you know, navigate. <laughs> so what you do see is something interesting. What is the Antarctic coast, according to the Piri Reis map, is that the South American coast just seems to start jutting out east once you get a little bit south of modern day Rio de Janeiro. And a lot of pseudo archaeologists have made the claim that this coastline that I'm so lovingly giving a close up on right now is actually the uh, Queen Mode coast of Antarctica. This theory began from the works of a guy named Arlington Mallory, who was a big proponent of the pre-Columbian transoceanic theory, which is essentially a theory that other people besides Columbus and probably besides Leif Erikson crossed over the Atlantic to visit the Americas. The theory died for several years until it was uh, brought back by another crank archaeologist in a book called uh, Rise of the Sea Kings, which sounds like some sort of, well, I guess we're not talking about D&D anymore. A, a Pathfinder 2nd Edition Adventure Path. Yeah. I was just looking over there and I have the Pathfinder book. Because I'm cool. Very cool. Essentially, the theory posited in Rise of the Sea Kings is that an ancient civilization, way older than ancient Egypt, actually explored the entire globe and seeded a lot of civilizations with their knowledge. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> These claims were then made popular again in 1967 in a book by Eric von Daniken called... Wait, I actually have this one too. It's a chariot of the gods by Eric von Daniken uh, that believes that spacemen visited Earth thousands of years ago and, and Piri Reis map, it shows up in here. You can even see in the little picture section, there's the Piri Reis map. It also features prominently in 1421, the year China discovered America, which is another uh, pre-Columbian transoceanic uh, hypothesis. It was a book that very popularly tried to make the claim that uh, Shungha and the uh, treasure fleet, I am very sorry, all Mandarin speakers, basically discovered the Americas before Columbus. A thing that is an, it's an unfact, it is untrue. <laughs> Not to say they couldn't have done it, it's just they didn't. Now, because this map was copied from a bunch of other maps, you start to see that uh, the geography is a little bit off and that there are some things that make sense if you understand how Piri Reis put it together. There are a bunch of rivers that come from basically nowhere. And if you look at the Americas, it's also a complete mess. North America is sort of a collection of islands. And so while this map is interesting for understanding how 16th century people understood the world, it's not a good map. So with all of that being known, then what is going on with this Antarctic coast thing here? The most predominant theory is that the Portuguese sailors who likely mapped this coast probably got lost at some point and were heading south, but thought that they were heading east and recorded the coastline as such. If that's not the case, it could also be a case of what we call Ptolemaic cartography, which was this way of map design that worked in the past. Now, the essential idea of, of Ptolemaic cartography is that 
the rest of the world that has not been explored yet should be something similar to what they've seen, which, you know, is Eurasia, which has a lot of landmass. So they thought that there was a, a terra nullis, a part of the Earth that uh, is just like another really big continent that we just haven't found yet, because then that balances out their concept of how the Earth looks. So in a lot of really old maps, you have huge blobby continents that actually have no basis in reality. It's just sort of their idea of balancing out the map. Now, by the time the Piri Reese map was made, this was starting to fall out of fashion already, but it could be that he stuck with it anyway, or he copied off of a map that did do it, but didn't uh, realize that that was what was happening. Furthermore, if this is Antarctica, it's several hundred kilometers north of where it should be. The Drake Passage has just been erased completely, and it also conflicts with the notes written about the region that say that it's a warm place. I know, I've never been to Antarctica myself, but uh, even the Flat Earthers know that the South Pole is very cold. They believe that it's literally an ice wall keeping all of the water in, so... Uh, it's gotta stay cold. <laughs> now, Graham Hancock, after talking about the Piri Reese map, goes into the Orontius Phineas map, which is another one that is used a lot by crank archaeologists to talk about stuff. It has another terra nullis that, um, if you squint and literally rotate it by, like, a whole bunch, it kind of looks like the mass of Antarctica, but not really. This map is actually often used by, uh, pseudo-archaeologists who try to, uh, deny climate change, which... Uh, prompted me to do some research and um, guess guess what Graham Hancock also doesn't believe in. <laughs> Anyways, a wonderful archaeology YouTuber named Mini Minute Man made a video about the Orontius Phineas map that is very good and I'm just going to link to that in the description because uh, if you want to know more, uh, I feel like I've done enough map nerdistry for one uh, YouTube video with a lot of ground to cover. So let's just move on to the next episode. <laughs> All right, going into episode five, we're going to Turkey and talking about Gobekli Tepe, which is actually in the entire show, the only time where we actually visit something that does have its origins at the end of the Ice Age. Based on everything we've been taught about prehistory, it shouldn't exist. Archaeologists accept that it dates back to around 11,600 years ago. The notion that there was no culture in the world that was capable of doing such things 12,000 years ago is blown out of the water. First of all, what is this attitude? Why is he acting as if archaeologists are all really horny to make sure that the past does not seem spectacular in any fashion? Again, this happens a lot with conspiracy theorists when they're trying to prove some sort of blatantly untrue position and implying that everybody else is conspiring and building some them purpose to undermine their crackpot theories. They never super go into why? Like, why are archaeologists all secretly conspiring together to unmake this grand theory that he's putting together? Again, this has like Facebook fake friends energy. So Can Hancock's overall theory is that the Atlanteans um, had this ancient civilization during the Ice Age and that after uh, some sort of calamity, they were essentially scattered across the world where they then bestowed their know-how on how to construct things to different civilizations that then arose all of the wonders that we see in the world today. And while that sounds like it fits really well, the main thing that it misses out on is time. Gobekli Tepe is astonishingly old. It is basically the oldest building that we know of. But here's where we can see that the timeline starts to fall apart. Because if Graham Hancock's timeline is correct, the ancient Atlantean civilization fell and they gave their gifts to the societies right afterwards and built things like Gobekli Tepe, but then also inspired like Giza and the Egyptians with their pyramids. But the pyramids were built 7,000 years after Gobekli Tepe. So what's the timeline? Why did they go to Anatolia and then just stay there for seven millennia? And then after building the pyramids, it took them over a thousand years to go to the Americas and inspire the architecture there. So like, why do we have Gobekli Tepe at 9,600 BCE? Then we've got Malta at 3,600 BCE, 6,000 years later. Egypt, 2,600 BCE, so another thousand years after that. And then Mexico at about 1,500 BCE, which is another 1.1 thousand years after that. So even if you were to take Graham Hancock's vibes-based idea that all of these came from a single civilization, he offers no evidence for those claims, but also 
doesn't have any evidence for these massive, unheardofly huge, hugely humongous gaps in time between these different uh, passings on of knowledge to different civilizations. Enough time that many, many generations of people would have passed. Built at a time when the Earth was just emerging from the last ice age. When the locals were still supposedly unsophisticated hunter-gatherers, living in mud huts. But if they weren't advanced enough to design and build this megalithic wonder, who did and why? We did it! We got to How Move Big Rock! Congratulations, Graham Hancock. You win the It's Probably Not Aliens slash Step Back award for most amount of time taken to get to How Move Big Rock. So the thrust of Graham Hancock's argument at Gobekli Tepe is that uh, the people who lived in the region who did not quite yet have farming would not have had the manpower to move the big rock in order to build something like this site. And what he's basing this off of here is some outdated analyses of the site. One of the common paradigms about uh, what made Gobekli Tepe such a mystery was that this was a site that would have required a lot of labor. Something that requires a lot of labor means a lot of work, which means a lot of calories and people who are not using their labor to collect more calories. And in times where you're in a foraging or hunter-gatherer, sort of the antiquated term society, the amount of calories being produced per person and the amount of calories being consumed is a much tighter ratio than, say, when you get to farming, where one person can uh, raise a lot more calories per person than the society actually requires, which allows for people to take their entire uh, existence and have it dedicated to something that's not just the accumulation of calories so that they can uh, survive to the next day. That's why you see a lot of these constructions timed around the period when people start farming. That's what makes Gobekli Tepe so interesting because the site was built while there were still hunter-gatherers and it's one of the ultimate archaeological things, which is you just have to learn that in the past, uh, people refuse to play by the rules. And even though, you know, the general grand theory is that you need a uh, settled civilization and farming in order to have the excess calories to get the excess labor to build something like a uh, megalith, they did it anyway. <laughs> So a lot of the data to inform this idea that there was a lot of labor needed to make Gobekli Tepe traces its origins to other research in places like Rapa Nui or Easter Island and the amount of labor it took to make and move the Moai statues. So using some of the experiments based on Rapa Nui, they had this belief that it would take dozens, as many as 50, 75 to 100 people uh, multiple weeks to not only carve out these T-shaped stones that make up the site, but then to move them the 15 kilometers that you need to get them to the place where they were eventually placed. However, and if you've been following more recent archaeology, you'll know that this uh, whole paradigm is starting to change. We used to have a lot of questions about how the sheer amount of calories and labor were even available to make something like the Pyramids of Giza, leading to the ancient aliens people to say a bunch of nonsense. But more recent experimental archaeology has been showing that you don't actually need as much labor to move these big rocks as you think. So more recent experimental research has shown that using things like water and other lubricants, as well as leverage and rope, you could move something like the stones at Gobekli Tepe to the places that they needed to go with as little as seven people. But typically the range fits in seven to 15 people, and that would only take a matter of weeks, not multiple, multiple months. This is based a lot on how Stonehenge was constructed, and essentially it narrows down to what was thought to be a large slave force uh, controlled by a religious elite that would take uh, years to put together, then kind of comes down to what could be an extended family group or like a single tribe of people, or possibly a village or something like that. Other experiments done at Gobekli Tepe itself shows that it would take about 12 to 24 people about four months to move all of the stones into place to build the currently exposed part of the complex. That is way fewer people than we imagined, and that means that a small village or a tribe or something like that could have spared that labor and still have had the calories available to hunt and gather and get the food needed to stay alive. Another interesting thing about that is that number also seems to fit 
the amount of people who could comfortably live in Gobekli Tepe. So this take here really does rob Neolithic hunter-gatherers of their agency and also kind of implies a, a stupidness on their part. And one of the most important things to note about our hunter-gatherer ancestors is that they weren't dumb. In fact, on a individual to individual basis, they probably had some cognitive ability superior to our own. So Hancock here is trying to prime people into thinking that hunter-gatherers are somehow simple or unintelligent or primitive, but also implies a sort of circular logic, like trying to say that the people at Gobekli Tepe couldn't possibly have built Gobekli Tepe because there's no evidence of them building when Gobekli Tepe is the evidence of them building. And he's even mentioned that a good chunk of the complex has not been excavated. So to make such a sweeping conclusion about the sort of development of megalithic structures in the area is uh, weak at best. I do want to return to this point though about hunter-gatherers because um, he mentions this a lot in Ancient Apocalypse where he sort of dismisses a lot of the abilities of people who lived a long time ago because they were simple, primitive hunter-gatherers. And furthermore, this subtracts from the genuine, interesting mysteries of the site. Gobekli Tepe implies a very different story of the origin of a lot of aspects of social organization. It seems to imply, through the uh, study of the site, that organized religion predates farming, which we didn't expect before. A lot of our concept about, you know, you go to farming, farming leads to complex societies, uh, assumes that to have a, a priest or um, to have organized religion, you need to have farming. Gobekli Tepe is uh, a stark rebuke of that, which, you know, I think plays a lot into David Graeber's understanding of human anthropology and history and uh, you know, really puts a feather in the cap of a lot of anarchist historians, anthropologists, and archaeologists, but uh, that's a whole different conversation, not one I'm ready to have right now. But his assumption that everybody has to be this baseline average uh, hunter-gatherer also subtracts the fact that there may be some exceptional people. Because like, yeah, maybe there were some people in other parts of the world who were hunting and gathering and did not have the capacity to build something like a Gobekli Tepe, but... Is it so hard to believe that in the entire population of humanity at the time that there weren't like 20 or 30 or 40 people who could have gotten together and figured it out? Uh, one writer made a really great comparison, which is that in our world, five people win the Nobel Prize every year out of eight billion. And if we're willing to accept that, you know, there are five people who are exceptional enough that they can develop these massive breakthroughs in science, is it hard to believe that one group of people were able to build these megaliths long before they were built anywhere else as like sort of a, a example of uh, an exception. Furthermore, in an attempt to uh, rebuke the common understanding of uh, who built Gobekli Tepe, he tries to make the argument that, you know, primitive hunter-gatherers couldn't possibly have built the site, so it must have been an actual settled society that did have farming that existed in the ancient past. The problem there is that Gobekli Tepe has land around it that has also had archaeological excavations happen, and at the site, we don't find any signs of settled civilization. There's no bones of domesticated animals, there's no remnants of crops, there's no farming implements or anything of the sort. And maybe archaeologists one day will solve some of these questions we still have about this site. It's a very interesting and exciting discovery. When we do answer those, it'll be done by archaeologists. Archeo and archaeology is a bit of a science and a bit of an art. It takes interpretation. There's going to be disagreements and debate over what happened at Gobekli Tepe or who built it or why. But I do know that when we do find some answers, it's going to be done in a long and thought out process and there's going to be evidence used to back it up, not just Graham Hancock's vibes. But on the topic of evidence, Graham Hancock also needs to answer some questions in order to posit his own theories. You can't just attach your theory to a bunch of existing sites, Graham. You need to find evidence that there actually was an Atlantis, which he provides zero cases of. Where's Atlantis? Where are the Atlantean skeletons? Where are the wrecks of these ancient marvels of construction? He claims they were all destroyed by an asteroid, but 
That's fairly convenient, isn't it? I mean, the dinosaurs were destroyed with a much bigger asteroid than any that would have wiped out this civilization, and yet we still find evidence of their existence. If there's no evidence really pointing towards the existence of an Atlantis, then what separates Graham Hancock's theories from the theories of J.R.R. Tolkien? And it's on that point that we then go into episode six, where Graham goes to America. He starts his tour at Poverty Point, an archeological site in Louisiana. Poverty Point is a site built by the ancient mound builder civilizations in the Americas. And every time the mound builders are brought up and it surprises people that these uh, ma massive constructions exist, I'm always surprised it surprises people. So to give a quick rundown, for a period of over 5,000 years, a bunch of different civilizations living in the United States or what would be the United States today, built massive stone mounds as either temple complexes or burials or just massive constructs for different reasons. It was just a common architectural practice in the area. The problem though is that we have a lot of myths about indigenous people that are steeped in white supremacy and racism. And so we're sheepish to talk about the people of ancient America, especially North America, as having a large and sophisticated and intricate a uh, settled civilization there. Because what the mound builder civilization and sites like Poverty Point show is that for thousands of years, there were cities, there were roads, there were population centers, there were advanced complex trading networks that connected the entire continent. So on that note, let's get deep into the claims around Poverty Point. The main uh, thrust of what Graham Hancock tries to say about the site is that it's all aligned with the stars which if that's true, would make sense. As I mentioned earlier in this video, the stars uh, would have played a large role to any civilization, hunter, gatherer, or farmer because the stars and planets uh, allow us to tell the progression of the seasons, which are important for essentially the basic survival skills you need to live. Keep in mind that there wasn't light pollution as much back then. So at night, the sky would be this majestic, open space filled with glittering gems of uh, amazing bits of this cosmos we live in. And there's no way to look at that. Like if you've ever been camping and looked at the sky at night, there's no way to not have a little bit of religious awe in what you see above you. That being said, Poverty Point's uh, alignment with the stars is disputed. A lot of different sites have people who make claims that they're aligned with one constellation or the sun or the solstices or whatever um, because of the confirmed connection that we have through studying uh, Stonehenge. The thing though is that there are lots of objects in the sky, so there are a lot of alignments that can be found. And it's much easier to posit a possible alignment than to actually confirm one uh, definitively. But in the 1980s, there was a theory that Poverty Point did line up using some aisles in the architecture of the site to line up with certain stars. But a few years later, this was retracted because of a more accurate LIDAR-based uh, mapping of the site. It turned out that their original analysis was off by about six degrees, which would take it off of alignment of the stars that they were looking for. But again, given how many stars there are, it's not hard to find an alignment to any site. The tricky part is looking to the evidence to see if that was an intentional feature of the people who built it. For example, one of the claims is that Poverty Point aligns north to south, which could be the case that they did look at it that way or they aligned it with the North Star or something like that. But it also could be that the creek that runs right by it also runs north to south and they were just building the site along that. Also, after the 1980s claims, uh, new attempts to find different stellar alignments require these two alignment points on the chart. And these alignment points don't actually map up to anything in the actual construction at Poverty Point, which means that they're just hypothetical spots. But if you stand at one of these two hypothetical spots called DP1 and DP2, yes, the sun rises over one mount on the solstices and another on the equinox, and that is very interesting. The problem though is that um, these sites don't line up with any actual architectural figures at the site. So it's not uh, apparent that there was any uh, intention by the people who built Poverty Point that there's actually any uh, alignment going on here. And second, uh, DP2, the second of the points, is on the other side of the creek from 
uh, Poverty Point's main construction site, and furthermore, was possibly underwater at the time of this construction. The second claim that Hancock makes uh, harkens back to the episode on Malta, which is that these are aligned to certain stars, but they are off kilter now because of the procession of the equinoxes, i.e. when they were built, you know, 20,000 years ago, as he claims, during the Ice Age, they were aligned to that star, but in the massive amount of time since, it's come off of alignment. And that's where we have to get to degrees of error and the way that we measure things. So there's no such thing as a measurement tool that has zero error. What you have to deal with is something called error term, which means that you need to get the uh, amount of possible error to be small enough that you can uh, do something useful with the measurement that you're taking. If you don't believe me, Ask anybody who works in construction. For example, the controversy that led to the falling apart of the early 1980 prediction about Poverty Point was that they were based on alignments generated from a point of view that was basically in the, centri the centroid of an ellipse that was about 30 feet across, which led to an error of about two to three degrees, which is pretty big. And so that prompted a lot of the doubt in the movement, which is, uh, very keen to note because Graham Hancock then goes on to claim that the snake mount uh, in a different part of the country is pointing at a certain constellation when it is off by two degrees because of the measurement error. And this kind of error rate becomes a big deal. For example, uh, we'll get into later in the episode, Snake Point, where Graham Hancock claims that the snake is pointing its head at a constellation as it was in the times of the last ice age as compared to now, but the difference between where that constellation was then and is now is about two degrees, which would be well within the margins of error for many measurement tools. Just before we wrap up on this episode, we then get to possibly the funniest moment in Ancient Apocalypse, where he tries to go to Serpent Mound to film there, but the, whoever the wonderful people are who work at Serpent Mound realized who he was and uh, didn't let him go to film at the site. So he does this thing where he goes to the site and in the parking lot for Snake Mound and does this like unhinged rant about how he's being suppressed by the archeologists because they don't want a well-known racist crank coming to their site and filming at it. I don't know. I thought it was some of the funniest shit in the entire documentary series. All right, let's dig into episode seven, where we got to talk about underground cities. And um, this is a location. It's also in Turkey. Uh, it's called Derumkuru Kayamalki. Uh... I am apologize to Turks for however that's supposed to be pronounced. So the original theory, which many historians still cling to today, was that the tunnels beneath Derinkuyu were carved out by Christians in the 7th century AD, trying to hide from Arab raiding parties. So in all of my time researching this, I was never able to find anybody who made this claim. So either it's a very outdated statement that nobody takes seriously anymore, or this is another piece of evidence that came from the University of Graham Hancock's ass. The overwhelming suspicion about who made this site, this underground city, is 7th to 8th century BCE Pharyngians. But then a group of Greek Christians moved into the site when the Roman Empire took over the region. Now these Greek Christians expanded the site immensely. That's why a lot of the outsider, like, you know, the larger expanded sections have a lot of Greek writing in them, have a lot of churches, things like that. So while digging into the stone and building the underground city did start a long time ago, a lot of its expansion happened while it was occupied by Greek Christians. And in that time, the region was under threat from Arab invaders because this was during the time of the Arab Byzantine Wars. And so those Greek Christians did use this underground city to uh, wall up and protect themselves from these regular attacks. And then in the 14th century, there were Mongolian invasions from Timur and they also used these areas to hide. So. Every time there were invaders, the underground city became a place of refuge. And then when the Roman Empire lost the region to the Ottomans, it became a place of refuge for those who were 
uh, basically for one reason or another under attack by the Ottoman regime. And even as recently as the 20th century, Cappadocian Greeks and Armenians used the site to hide away from the Ottoman authorities. But in 1923, the Christian inhabitants were expelled from the Ottoman Empire and sent to Greece in the sort of big population transfer and it went abandoned for several decades. It wasn't discovered again until 1963 when a Turkish man was trying to renovate his house and digging some new walls and eventually cracked through and found an entire underground city. See, in my opinion, I think scholarship is going too far uh, to say this was the 8th century BC because those, those are the earliest dates that we find people using it. All right. But that we don't necessarily know that they made it then. Maybe, maybe it was already made. I mean, you could theoretically say this about literally anything. This is the logic that creationists use. Yes, all evidence points to this group of people being the people who did this, but but what if it wasn't? What, what, if, it, what if it wasn't though? <laughs> it concerns those telltale marks left by hand axes on the walls of Derinkuyu. Just a mile outside Derinkuyu, Turkish archeologists exploring an ancient riverbed found several hand axes and stone tools dating back to around 9,500 BC, the end of the last ice age. Now this is an incredibly flimsy argument. Yes, this does show evidence that there were people in the region at the time, but other than that, your entire base of evidence is just conjecture. He then goes on to look at another underground city and then just guesses that they were all connected by kilometers of underground tunnels. Again, to a, to a degree that I was actually surprised, this is based on literally nothing. He, just stuff he made up or stuff that he uh, intuits. Again, we're getting back to his, his vibes-based reasoning. In the case of Graham Hancock, I feel like I don't know anybody else who's needed a vibe check more in their life. Okay, we are in the home stretch. Episode eight, the one where I pretend to be a geologist. <laughs> so basically throughout this entire series of Ancient Apocalypse, Graham Hancock has been trying to build the case that there's this hidden advanced white civilization that has uh, been influencing all of the great works of archae archeological wonder in human history. The main thing that comes up when you think about that is, well, Where's this Atlantis? Ooh, he doesn't say Atlantis, but where is uh, this hypothetical civilization in, in the grand scheme of things? You know, th there should be evidence of a hyper advanced Ice Age civilization if one actually existed, right? No. Graham Hancock would mock you for uh, demanding him to give any evidence that something exists. And instead, he spends the last episode trying to posit why exactly there is no evidence for anything that he's claiming and it is that um that the entire civilization got hit with a meteor yep so the first thing that we're going to talk about is something called the channeled scab land a large part of this general area uh was carved out during the end of what's called the younger dry ass period um i'm not going to go for the obvious joke there but the important thing to know is I'm going to be saying Younger Dryas quite a bit in this next little segment. But basically what the Younger Dryas was, was this dry but very cold period near the end of the last ice age. And this region shows some interesting signs of massive flooding as the Younger Dryas began to end, the temperature started to rise, and basically massive floods as giant glaciers began to melt started to shape the landscape. The important thing, so to, to, to sort of put out together what Graham Hancock's trying to say, is that he's arguing that there is a situation in which there was this ancient lake that was being dammed up by old glaciers, and that every once in a while this glacier would, you know, on a pretty regular schedule, melt and cause huge amounts of flooding. And he says that this is a very controversial take, and that most geologists uh, disagree with this notion. They refuse to accept that catastrophes like a huge flood moving cubic kilometers of water and shaping entire landscapes could happen in a short amount of time. Because scientists are so 
obsessed with the idea that change has to be slow and gradual so something catastrophic could never happen. And you know what? Graham Hancock might have had a point if he had said this a hundred years ago, but that's not the state of geology today, obviously. I apologize to everybody who has a greater grasp on geology than I do. I'm trying my best here, but I am definitely wading into waters I don't belong in. And unlike Graham Hancock, when I do that, I tend to become more humble about the things I say, not less. So the way that it goes, about a hundred years ago in the field of geology, there was this idea called uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism uh, established itself as a strict uh, refutation of biblical creationist ideas. The idea that a lot of things were a lot younger, you know, young earth creationism and things like that. And they believed that the ways that we can see the geology of the world becoming shaped uh, can be seen in the things that we see today shaping the environment. It's not a terrible idea, but it's definitely incomplete. You know, we've seen mountain glaciers shaping the landscape. So in the past, areas will probably shaped by other mountain glaciers, right? And most of the processes that we see change the landscape are slow, at least on a human scale. And so the assumption that a lot of geologists had was that a lot of the change in the earth happens slow and gradually. And to their credit, a lot of it does. <laughs> but obviously they got too locked into their refutation of young earth creationism and they went a little bit too overboard insisting that everything was slow and gradual. Now, they weren't completely against catastrophic uh, changes to the landscape, but their thinking was that if there were catastrophic changes to the landscape, they would have to be based on something that they can see there. So if there was signs of a massive volcanic eruption, that makes sense as long as there's a volcano nearby to pinpoint it to. But for example, if we see landscapes that show signs of glaciers flattening them, but there's no glacier around, they would assume based on the way things looked that glaciers did do it, but they would have done it very slowly. But over the course of the 20th century, geologists had to acknowledge that there were periods where catastrophic changes did make massive changes to the landscape. And in fact, the scab lands that this episode's talking about are one of the major things that started the change. So the way that it went is that the scab lands, which show signs of massive flooding happening, like massive flooding on a scale that we can't really comprehend today, a guy by the name of J.H. Bretz proposed in 1923 that it was done by some sort of massive flood, which he called the Spokane Flood Hypothesis. This was rejected by geologists of the time who were still firmly stuck in this gradualism based on their fights with young earth creationists. But by the 1960s, the evidence had become so clear that a massive flood, not a gradual glacier change, had shaped the landscape that it became the realm of mainstream geology. Because unlike Graham Hancock, geologists are scientists who look at evidence and change their position on things based on it. And it also makes sense. At the end of the Younger Dryas, the Earth was warming up and a lot of the Earth's water was held up in these massive glaciers that scarred the continent. So as they started to melt, they would cause huge amounts of flooding because this water had been trapped in glaciers for 60,000 years. And once the temperature started moving up, it had to get to the sea somehow. In fact, as of 2021, there's a pretty strong hypothesis that one of these massive floods is what started the Younger Dryas uh, in the first place. Lake Agassiz might have caused a flood where more than 21,000 cubic kilometers of water fled in a truly apocalyptic drainage event. And that could have changed the salinization of the water. It could have changed the flow patterns in the ocean and essentially do the day after tomorrow, but in a much slower fashion. And they think that that much water changed the uh, contents of the ocean so much that it caused this snap cold of the Younger Dryas period. To give an example about how big a deal that was, the flood that caused the Scablands, uh, the draining of Lake Missoula, was probably about 12% of the size of this older event. But Hancock, instead of looking to these sort of catastrophic changes of massive flooding and such like that, instead goes to a different theory that the Younger Dryas period began because 
of asteroid impacts. Now, as far as I can pick up from the geologists, this has been investigated, but there are other events like Lake Agassiz that have way stronger basis and less evidence really giving any credence to the idea that an asteroid would have caused this uh, change. Because a lot of catastrophes happen near the end of the Ice Age, and an asteroid is not required to have the massive climate change that we see define the Younger Dryas. And some of these were huge catastrophes like the draining of Lake Akasis, but there are also other more gradual processes that also contributed to the initiation of the Younger Dryas. The changing of precipitation patterns, the changing of oceanic uh, currents, and some of the very disruptive events that really are iconic of the end of the Ice Age, like the dying off of the massive Ice Age megafauna, would have been catastrophic for the human population living at the time. But what is a short period of time in a geological standpoint would have been multiple generations to our human ancestors, and definitely is way more gradual than being wiped out by a meteor strike. As Graham Hancock's pointed out several times in the series, the ocean levels rose by over a hundred feet, but that took thousands of years to happen. And furthermore, this catastrophe shows up in the archaeological record as well. We can see in the archaeological record a lot of evidence that the draining of Lake Missoula had a deep impact, no pun intended, on our uh, Stone Age hunter-gatherer ancestors who lived in the area. What we don't find is evidence of the same disruption happening to some sort of hyper-advanced Atlantean civilization as well, probably fighting it out with the Koreans and the Finns in the hyper-war. And that's especially a problem because an advanced civilization would have left some more uh, durable remnants behind, you know, the remnants of buildings and uh, ruins, way more than hunter-gatherers would be behind. But we're finding lots of hunter-gatherer detritus, you know, the evidence of places they lived, things they threw out, things they created, but no pyramids, massive stones, like, you know, megaliths, no evidence of any Ice Age ruins, basically. So then if Hancock is right, and an asteroid wiped out this civilization, then it was a very selective asteroid that wiped out exactly the spots where the evidence uh, would be that Hancock needs to make his case. And Hancock's not alone in this belief that an asteroid is what caused the Younger Dryas. It's called the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis, and it's largely been debunked by geologists today, but there are some people who are still trying to make the case for it. Again, the accepted idea today is that the draining of Lake Agassiz is what initiated the Younger Dryas, i.e. the pouring of a huge amount of fresh water, an unimaginable of fresh water, into the ocean, and that sort of changed the whole climate. Instead, they're making the argument that it was asteroids. The evidence they posit for it is a multitude. They believe that they've found uh, black mats that represent a younger dry-ass barrier, which is basically like a layer of debris that would show evidence that an asteroid hit on that level, sort of like the KT boundary with the dinosaurs. They claim that this uh, lines up with evidence of massive forest fires and things like the decline of the Clovis civilization in North America, and even that it was directly responsible for the destruction of all of the megafauna at the end of the Ice Age. So the geologists who propose this have put evidence forward of finding things like nano diamonds and uh, metallic spherules. This, I'm saying a lot of things that I'm just reading off of a paper, but basically they think that they have found little bits of uh, pieces of rock and gemstones and things like that that really only show up when there is a high pressure, high heat event like an asteroid collision. But as far as I can tell, none of the people who have made this claim have ever been able to produce evidence that actually stands up to any rigor. Like, I don't know how accessible I'm going to be if I say things like nano diamonds actually turned out to be misidentified graphene and graphene graphate oxide aggregates. <laughs> Some of the metallic spheres have turned out to be the remnants of fungus or feces or other sorts of uh, biological material that is fossilized. And there's some trace amounts of things like iridium, which are common in asteroid impacts, but they also have uh, terrestrial explanations. Another line of evidence used by people who promote this hypothesis are what are called black mats. In fact, there's a little bit in the episode of Ancient Apocalypse where they look at these black mats. And yes, things like that can be seen at impact sites, but 
They're also seen at sites where there's a lot of decaying biomatter that happens in a slow process, i.e. Uh, a bog, basically. And when you see these black mats, you can just as easily suspect that it could have been the place where an ancient swamp used to be. And furthermore, when you control for many different factors, radiocarbon dating shows that these black mats did not show up at the same time, which really puts a crimp in the concept that they were all created by various asteroid impacts. There's a lot of stories that are similar to this. I'll just give one example. In 2018, an investigation in Greenland seemed to have unearthed a uh, asteroid impact location. And some people who worked on that site made some claims, especially to the press, saying that they believed that this was time to the beginning of the Younger Dryas, which then gives some evidence to this hypothesis. But then a few years later, you know, after the press has moved on, doing some more accurate dating and, you know, a longer amount of study that doesn't have the journalists jump on it right away, then they uncover that actually this you know, 20 something thousand year old impact crater looks more like it dropped maybe 58 million years ago, which misses the younger dry ass by a, a tad. Another argument that uh, proponents of the hypothesis put forward is that all of the megafauna of the Pleistocene died out at the same time, which gives some credence the idea that an asteroid impact killed them all but that also does not bear fruit at all. We see discrepancies in the decline of megafauna in the end of the Pleistocene as big as 400 years, for example. South America's megafauna died out 400 years after North America, and uh, mammoths in Asia lived a lot longer than mammoths in North America, and there were even a few like island mammoths that lasted all the way up until about 3000 years ago. And in the forest fire case, a lot of the evidence put forward that shows a bunch of forest fires happening at the same time still see discrepancies uh, in radiocarbon dating that show that they happened as much as several hundred years separated from each other. And lastly, it's not a term I like to use, but the indigenous population of North America uh, who were called the Paleo Indians at that point, uh, did not see a major demographic collapse time to the beginning of the Younger Dryas. And if there was a catastrophic meteor impact, there would be some evidence of a huge decline in the population happening very dramatically and very quickly. And another part of Graham's overall oeuvre, his, 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 his body of work, like uh, Ancient Apocalypse is more or less an adaptation of his book that came out in 2015. One part that didn't make it into the Netflix documentary is that this part of his 2015 book was framed around him trying to prove that Noah's flood happened. And everything that he put out was resoundingly debunked by the geological uh, experts of its day. And yet he pushed forward with it anyway, seven years later. Okay, so that was Ancient Apocalypse episode by episode. I'm very sweaty. I'm very tired. Can we go home now? No, no, we cannot. Now we should probably talk a little bit about his overall work and the history of people trying to do the exact same thing Graham Hancock does. So first of all, Ancient Apocalypse uses almost every tool out of the pseudoscience playbook. The first thing is he spends a lot of the runtime of the show instead of making the case for his position just demonizing experts and the concept of archeologists in general. But there's actually a very high production value, which means that to a lot of people who don't wanna do an in-depth investigation, because unlike me, they're mentally healthy, they would see something, see it being so slick and well-produced, and because of that slickness, get an idea that this must be legit. You know, it's on a big streaming platform, it's well-made, you wouldn't get this much money behind something if it didn't have legitimacy, right? And after this whole tour of Graham Hancock playing fantasies with other people's heritage, he leaves out actually quite a bit because Graham Hancock didn't come out of nowhere. He's a known quantity. He's one of the most well-known pseudo-archaeologists. In fact, if you go to the Wikipedia page for pseudo-archaeologists, his picture is there right beside Eric von Daniken, the guy whose book inspired Ancient Aliens. So what's important to talk about is what does Graham Hancock from his body of work leave out of Ancient Apocalypse, where a lot of people are likely to see his work for the first time. Well, the first thing I mentioned several times in this uh, video and going through the episodes of the show that he comes to a lot of conclusions, not through evidence or research, but through vibes. And he doesn't explain why he does that, 
But if you go into his work, you'll find that he's inspired pretty heavily by basically Western esotericism. He has a fairly well-developed philosophy that he talks about in his work that in some ways he puts more credence in evidence that comes through his intuition and through revelation. And oftentimes this intuition and revelation comes to him through doing a lot of psychedelics. <laughs> Outside of Ancient Apocalypse, the other thing that Graham Hancock's probably most well known for, you know, outside of weirdos like me, is a 2013 TEDx talk he did that Ted has uh, subsequently taken down called The War on Consciousness, in which he goes on a long spree about uh, his interest in psychedelics, especially ayahuasca, and how much of an impact that had on his personal outlook on things. You can still find it on YouTube if you look for it, but not on any of Ted's official channels. So if a lot of his intuition-based assumptions about the ways the past works seem like they're based on taking drugs, it's probably because they are. Now, I'm not somebody who's going to bash people for what kind of drugs they want to take, you know? You enjoy your altered states of consciousness in whichever way you want. Hell, I'd even join you. But he seems to have taken his uh, interest in hallucinogens and developed it into a totalizing uh, intuition-based understanding of the world, which flies in the face of reality and evidence. And that is the opposite of what science tries to do. The problem, though, is that he takes this intuition and vibes-based understanding of the world and tries to frame it as if it's scientific inquiry. But a lot of what Graham Hancock says makes a lot more sense if you understand that his goal is more metaphysical than scientific. Another thing that he cut drastically out of Ancient Apocalypse, but I mentioned several times, is that a lot of his work is dedicated to proving the existence of Atlantis. At the end of the day, the ancient civilization that he talks about over and over again in Ancient Apocalypse is Atlantis. Several of the experts he talked to, like Denny Hillman, Nato Wijaya, and Marco Vigato, are both big people in the realm of pseudo-archaeological writing trying to prove the existence of Atlantis. And why does that matter? Because Hancock himself, as well as the history of looking for Atlantis, has quite a troubling history. So to get started, I guess I should tell you what Atlantis is. Essentially, Atlantis is a work of fiction made by Plato and ancient times, and what Atlantis was supposed to be is a parable about the dangers of hubris. You know, they're supposed to be the antagonist to ancient Athens, which uh, through Plato's understanding is the ideal state, and is supposed to show why his ideas that are sort of laid out in the Republic are superior to that of the haughty Atlanteans, who for their own uh, pride were stricken down by the gods. And that's basically where it stood until in the 19th century, some uh, people who had theories decided to develop that it actually was an oral tradition that goes way older than Plato and has roots in an actual ancient civilization. The most famous would be Ignatius Donnelly, who wrote uh, basically a huge seminal work uh, on the possible existence of Atlantis, one that Graham Hancock has said over and over again has a lot of inspiration on his own work. Donnelly laid out the center pillars of the theory that there was a very ancient, hyper-advanced civilization that was wiped out, and in doing so, uh, they seeded the, um, the basis of civilization as it began. It was an attempt to warp the history of humanity to make sure that all of the different advancements of many different peoples and different civilizations all could be explained through a white supremacist lens because they were all just inspired by ancient white people. And you know who was another organization that was interested in the Atlantis theory because they too were trying to warp history to fit a um, mythological idea of the understanding of themselves. And that was the Nazis. Yeah. There's no real talking about the history of people trying to prove that Atlantis is real without talking about Nazis. The Nazi party became very invested in trying to prove that there was an ancient civilization 
that bestowed its ingenuity on the rest of the world, and they believed that they were called the Aryans, because the entire Nazi project was an attempt to look into the record and try to prove that ancient Germanic Teutons were the people who basically started all of civilization. And to this end, the Nazis invested in a lot of radical, weird, and often pseudo-archaeology. That's the reason why Nazis played a large role in, like, the Indiana Jones movie. That's why they were looking for the Lost Ark, because they actually were in the real world. But less popular than their search for the Ark of the Covenant is their search for Atlantis. The idea that there was an ancient Aryan civilization that built Atlantis and sort of developed all of the civilization in the world comes from a theory by a guy by the name of Hermann Wirth, but then was very, very popular with a guy by the name of Heinrich Himmler. And through almost the entire time of the Third Reich, Heinrich Himmler had a, a drive to find the location of the lost city of Atlantis. And the way that they believed it is that 25,000 years ago, there was a hyper-advanced Atlantis civilization that after it was destroyed, it uh, its, its direct descendants were the Nordic people, who then became the primordial Germans. And that through this idea, this Nordic race was supposed to be the natural leaders and uh, guide for humanity. Anyways, Himmler worked with Wirth to try and establish this truth by putting together an elite group of archaeologists who actually went around the world trying to find evidence of this lost civilization. And after the defeat of the Third Reich, this descended into neo-Nazism, specifically into a sort of weird realm of esoteric Nazis who get really into some of the strange pseudo-scientific and pseudo-archaeological claims of the Nazis, these are the people who believe in, like, you know, Nazis on the moon and Nazi time travel and all sorts of stuff like that. And also into kind of strange mysticism. It, it's a very weird world and one that I probably should make a video about at some point, as now the history guy who documents the far right of YouTube I've become, apparently. Uh, but Atlantis became part of that. It has a lot of connections with, like, the New Age movement and the mystics and such like that. And it's the reason why you find weird connections between like new agey crunchy people and the far right. It's the reason why there's a strange phenomenon of like Instagram pastel lifestyle gurus who seem to be really into QAnon. So then comes in Graham Hancock who writes a book in 1995 called Fingerprints of the Gods, which is a lightly updated version of Ignatius Donnelly's original work. And Ancient Apocalypse is an adaptation of his 2015 book, Magicians of the Gods. And in many of these Atlantis uh, narratives, there's a lot of emphasis, including in Hancock's work, of the white skin of the Atlanteans. And the general image is that they were this white, benevolent master race that taught all of their ingenuity to the uncivilized brown peoples of the world, teaching them how to do hard things like move big rock. This kind of thinking has shown up over and over again in attempts to uh, justify white supremacy and colonization. It was used by Andrew Jackson to justify Indian removal. It has been used many times throughout history to justify the horrific things that white people have inflicted upon the peoples of this world. But that's not a complete picture because uh, Hancock has changed tone on this a little bit. And now he tries to say that Atlantis was actually indigenous people, and he's actually become a bit of a proponent for native rights, but still in his work is a very imperialist narrative that a lot of these indigenous peoples were just too simple, too dumb to be able to do the amazing works that they did. And a lot of his writing about hunter-gatherers has a sort of classist idea of them being like takers, you know? lay about nobodies who never moved big rock in their life. And I would be completely remiss because this part didn't get into ancient apocalypse at all, that he also has argued in a sort of Bimini Road type fashion that there are artificial structures on Mars, because there's, you know, there's structures like the Bimini Road on Mars, and um, that there was a hyper-advanced ancient civilization on the Red Planet. It's weird that that one didn't make it into the Netflix show. <laughs> 
Okay, I think it's time we talked about racism and ancient apocalypse and Graham Hancock's overall theory. Because when you look at a lot of ancient apocalypse's arguments, especially the ones that come more from Graham Hancock's general vibe of things, you notice something very quickly. A lot of his claims of who built a lot of the amazing megaliths and structures of the ancient past get stripped away from the indigenous people who made them in service of giving credit to some mystical Atlantean white uh, predecessor. This comes directly from white supremacist ideologies in the 19th century of colonists who went to various places around the world and saw wonders built by ancient indigenous peoples and came to the conclusion that these, uh, through their uh, racist ideology, subhumans were incapable of making such architectural wonders. And Graham Hancock is just one piece in a long story of people looking at these works and saying, well, a non-European could not have possibly made that. And this comes out not only through his uh, takes, but also you see this in a lot of the people he brings on. I mentioned in the episode where he talked about uh, Tesco Tsingo that he brought on a guy by the name of Marco Vigado. And I told you to put a pin in that because Marco Vigado is a very interesting character. You'll see here that there's even a moment where they mention that he wrote a book about Atlantis. This book, Empires of Atlantis, has been described by one archaeologist as one of the most racist books I've ever read. Also described as hard to respond to or review because of how thoroughly incorrect all of its statements are. Because the main thrust of the book is Vigado says that through science and what he calls esoteric traditionalism, he wants to establish that the true cradle of civilization is Atlantis and not Africa. And it's important to mention when we're talking about the genealogy of Atlantis as a pregenitor to all major civilizations on Earth, that the number one key thing that they all say that is very important to understanding is that to them, Atlanteans are white, and that the predecessor to all the civilizations on Earth, they are trying to twist to make sure that they are all originated from white people. And one of the champions of this claim was Graham Hancock. He's been saying it less often lately, but in his book from 1995, Fingerprints of the Gods, he lays out that he believes that the Atlanteans, who he is trying to over and over make the case are the progenitors of all of these indigenous uh, creations and wonders, are indeed white people. You see a little bit of this at the end of the episode where he goes to Mexico, because he talks about the legends surrounding the god Quetzalcoatl, and specifically references to him being bearded which is an old trope that isn't true. But the important part, the other side of that that doesn't get mentioned, is that part of this trope is also that Quetzalcoatl had a beard and white skin. He's playing into the Donald Trump playbook. You know, you come up right to the edge of saying something inexcusable, but something that you know that the right kind of audience is going to resonate with. And then if anybody calls you out on getting to that point, then they're like, well, I, I didn't say that. I, I, no, I'm back away from that. I just said bearded, you know? It's, it's not a great look. So this might come as a surprise, but Ancient Apocalypse also is in the middle of the culture war right now, or at least it was a few months ago. In fact, more and more paranormal and pseudo-history, pseudo-archaeology, pseudo-science is all getting wrapped up as the American right starts to get more weird. So yeah, this is about to just get very, very normal. Graham Hancock is now a uh, member adjacent to the intellectual dark web, which is sort of a group of free thinking individuals who all seem to parrot the exact same right wing talking points. People like Tucker Carlson, people like Joe Rogan, people like Jordan Peterson. In fact, Joe Rogan shows up in Ancient Apocalypse quite a bit himself. Like the intellectual dark web, Ancient Apocalypse tries to cast doubt on experts and privileges emotional needs over evidence in order to fit a political agenda, which fits in really well with the overall intellectual dark web and right-wing desire to essentially undo any idea of a shared reality. And at the meantime, throwing away academia, science, history, you name it. Because here's the thing about history, despite what the people in some of my comments would like to believe, it is always going to be inherently political. Politics is basically the discussion about who does and does not have power. And history is more than just 
what happened in the past, what we prioritize, whose stories we tell, whose we don't, and how we frame them are always going to be part of the historical discussion. And whenever you do that, whenever you are debating whose story gets told and why and how, you're going to get political. Probably the most obvious example would be the debate around Confederate monuments and how these crappy statues that were put up in order to uh, basically show opposition to the civil rights movement were brought up as preservations of American history because we need to preserve all of the past, even the dark parts, with these statues valorizing slave owners. Turns out a lot of those Confederate monument people never really seem to want something like, I don't know, maybe putting in the middle of Atlanta a giant statue of General Sherman or something. <laughs> And you've seen in states like Texas and Florida and Virginia, as well as many others, the intentional practice by the right to try and shut down the teaching of history and really restrict it, especially when talking about uh, sexual diversity and race. To the point where just last weekend, as I'm filming this, there was this wonderful video showing the extent of the censorship going on in Florida, where there's just rows and rows of empty books because they got rid of anything that they thought did not fit their preconceived narrative. And like that conservative freakout over the teaching of basic history, Ancient Apocalypse is also on a crusade to attack uh, academic scholarship, expertise as a concept, and really any form of specialization in fear that academia is promoting the wrong kind of social change. Because at the end of the day, Ancient Apocalypse is one white millionaire trying to tell you to ignore the vast body of research done by thousands of archaeologists over uh, centuries, piecing together meticulously and with lots of research the story of humanity. So no wonder conservatives love this guy. Which is really weird because in his like political positions, for the most part, Graham Hancock seems kind of liberal. In the promotion of ancient apocalypse with these new people who are you know grabbing onto his stuff he has used the right-wing outrage machine to essentially try and defend himself he regularly retweets people like matt walsh who is the actual said he was a fascist guy on the daily caller he's called his critics woke for disagreeing with him which is now one of those terms that's just turned into a right-wing snarl word. It's the critical race theory of 2023. And he's a regular guest on the far-right Joe Rogan Experience podcast where he complains about getting cancel cultured by academics. Basically going on rants against elite liberal academics who refuse to acknowledge his vague feelings instead of their facts. Ancient Apocalypse is also filled with him just going on long, kind of unhinged rants against academia. And oftentimes what archaeologists have established as their uh, consensus over what happened in the past gets completely disregarded in favor of Graham Hancock's vibes and feelings. It's really hard to debunk big chunks of Ancient Apocalypse because he essentially just says, well, it doesn't feel like that to me. And like, where do you even start with that? And so it probably shouldn't surprise you that one of the biggest fans of Graham Hancock who made an entire video talking about how much he likes his ideas is Jake and Jelly, aka the QAnon shaman. And so even if Graham Hancock thinks that he's not part of this reactionary right-wing hate machine, he's like at least bathing in those waters for clout. And all that is to be said, I actually want to talk a little bit about Ancient Aliens, because Ancient Aliens is actually way worse. It has way bigger reach. It often platforms uh, radical racists. It's had Tucker Carlson on as a guest several times, and uncritically has guests on that are open grifters or just known lunatics. Ancient Aliens has had anti-government conspiracies, weird love letters towards Vladimir Putin, and just conspiracy theories that veer into the very dangerous territory. The only reason why Ancient Apocalypse has gotten so much attention in the press while like Ancient Aliens just sort of goes by the side and is written off is because uh, Ancient Apocalypse was on Netflix, which is the prestige streaming platform that uh, a lot of the elite media people watch. So they don't see History Channel promoting the insane like neo-Nazi conspiracy theories that they do because they don't watch History Channel, but they do watch Netflix. And they saw in big words right on November 11th when the uh, episode came out, Ancient Apocalypse. And that's why it got all the attention. Man, Ancient Aliens really does suck. If only someone did like a, a weekly podcast or something about it. Oh, wait, that's me. 
I'm the one and Scott who do the the, the thing that it's probably not aliens. There's a podcast. You should listen to it. Both it and this video are both on Nebula. That's right. It's the Nebula time. Sha like a ninja. I'm 34 years old. Yes, yeah, part of a crossover between Step Back and It's Probably Not Aliens, I'm doing with Scott. We're making an episode, possibly two, going deep into Graham Hancock, deep into the career and takes of 30 years of Graham Hancock. So if you like this video, you're definitely going to want to listen to that. And subscribers to Nebula get access to that episode a full week early. Subscribers also saw this video early and without the ad that you're watching right now. Plus, in about a week after this video comes out, they're watching next month's video, which won't come out until March 20th. And let me tell you, it's a special one. All right, now I'm going to go and call actual Noam Chomsky. But not only do Nebula subscribers get access to premium content and ad-free videos for my channel, for It's Probably Not Aliens, but for tons of creators that I know you like. Scott Nicewander of NerdSync, the co-host of the podcast, is on there. You've got Abigail Thorne of Philosophy Tube, whose play The Prince is coming out as a Nebula original, which had a big, fancy premiere in New York City. you got the YouTuber who creates imposter syndrome in me every time he makes a video, Jacob Geller. You've got Tom Nicholas. you got Mia Mulder. you got Jesse Gender. you got FD Signifier. It's a very long and very great list. And if you sign up in the link, you can also get access to Nebula classes. Nebula classes are a really cool thing where a bunch of creators on the Nebula platform have made entire courses talking about how they make the things that they make. It's both great for those who aspire to become creators in their own right, or those who want to look behind the curtain and see how the sausage gets made. You ground the meat, you put it in the tube. Now, I wouldn't be pushing Nebula if it wasn't a great deal. If you go to nebula.tv slash step back and sign up, you can get it for as little as a bit over two and a half dollars a month. Furthermore, if you do use the link, nebula.tv slash step back, uh, you can find it also in the description or in the pinned comment. You will be directly supporting yours truly, Tristan, because a portion of the subscriptions that sign up through that link directly support me. So yes, thank you so much to everyone who signs up. Thank you to Nebula for letting me keep doing this as a living. And I feel like I've pitched enough for one time. Let's Let's get into the content, shall we? Let's talk about some major media companies. For example, Discovery. Discovery, which has a, you know, reputation for being educational, has done things like send Megan Fox to go and find out whether or not ancestral Native Americans were a mix of humans and biblical giants, or have people like comedian Rob Riggle talk about Atlantis and aliens. Because here's the thing, pseudo-archaeology, pseudo-history, and conspiracy theories are good money. and. Discovery, which also owns CNN, by the way, has uh, invested a lot in their pseudoscience, pseudohistory, pseudoarchaeology, paranormal stuff. And these programs are easy to make, and you don't have to put a lot of effort to get a lot of attention. In fact, if you look at a lot of these shows, a lot of the information they talk about seems to come from the first couple results in Google. And it's not harmless. History Channel has run specials where they tried to make the claim that one of the Three Stooges, a Jewish person, was actually Hitler in disguise. History Channel also has a spin-off show of Ancient Aliens starring Jan von Helsing, who is an author who regularly talks about esoteric Nazi stuff like I mentioned earlier, as well as plenty of other anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. They gave that guy a huge platform and a whole lot of money. A lot of these channels have worked extensively with Jan Pulitzer, who is a big lie believer and spent a lot of his energy trying to undo the results of the 2020 election in the United States. This guy has looked for the Ark of the Covenant with the History Channel and the Fountain of Youth with the Science Channel. Virtually every flavor of pseudo-history, and pretty much all of them have roots in white supremacy, uh, can be found on these major networks. There's stuff talking about how indigenous Americans are actually the descendants of white people. That's America unearthed. There's also shows about the Deep State, the Illuminati, the New World Order, the Knights Templar, and a whole lot of other crank conspiracy theories being put out by channels that are supposed to have a reputation for teaching and educating, like the History Channel, the Science Channel, Discovery. And a lot of mainstream journalists have been ignoring this for years while uh, people's concept of a shared reality has been broken apart by this absolute trash on basic cable. 
And none of my, you know, highly educated colleagues or mainstream journalists or even fellow progressive YouTubers have looked deep into this festering pile of crap that is very much responsible for the disintegration of a shared reality that has led to the absolute mess we live in today. It's about conspiracism and the positioning of Hancock as the victim of a conspiracy. The repeated disparaging remarks about archaeologists and other academics in every episode of Ancient Apocalypse is needed to remind the audience that the alternative past being proposed is true regardless of the lack of conclusive evidence for it. And the vagueness of who the supposed advanced civilization was, combined with the credence given to it by being a Netflix produced series, is going to make Ancient Apocalypse an easily moldable source for anyone looking to fill in a fantasied mythical past. You'll not be surprised to find out that this stuff is very popular with Republicans, older people, conservatives in general, and all of those people, as we've seen, have just taken a fucking rocket ship away from reality in the last decade or so as these things have gotten popular. And furthermore, the far right has been using this pseudo-history and pseudo-archaeology as an in to build their case with conservatives and Republicans and right-wingers in general in order to advance their white supremacist agendas. This has a long history going back all the way to the 19th century with groups like the Theosophical Society. It's part of why, you know, we put a lot of effort into debunking pseudoscience, but I think that pseudo-history and pseudo-archaeology are just as important to address and confront. Everything from Helena Blavatsky to Graham Hancock have been working to undermine especially the heritage of non-white peoples around the world. And rhetoric like the kind used in Ancient Apocalypse, sowing discord, trying to uh, undermine the concept of expertise, of scholarship, of academia as a concept, has led to COVID denial has led to QAnon, has led to anti-vaccine bullshit, has led to the railing against basic city planning we're seeing in recent days. Because the number one predictor of believing in a conspiracy theory is believing in another conspiracy theory. Once you've bought into a conspiracy, your departure from reality and the way that your thinking can break with uh, you know, things based on evidence then can be a stepping stone to more radical and more dangerous conspiracies to come. And this is extremely insulting to the field of archaeology, an extremely diligent and focused field of study. These people will spend days studying centimeters of excavation. It has a troubled history, but in recent times, repatriation of indigenous people's artifacts and having an ethical code for understanding that you're working with the stories of other people have become more the norm. And also because of the need for external grant funding to do digs, archeology span kind of requires public attention and interest in order to function. In short, archeologists need to do the important work that they're doing, the trust of people the kind of trust that Hancock is working in order to prove his weird esoteric theories is undermining. And then it only goes on people's radar when it goes on to Netflix, a prestige streaming platform that the upper middle class journalist class actually pays attention to. Maybe if they had been paying attention to the racist, Eurocentric, bigoted, backwards, completely absent from logic stuff that had been put out on the History Channel, on Discovery, and watched by these people, we might have had a better understanding of how you lead to things like the 2016 election. Television viewer demographics have shown that there is a large connection between interest in ancient aliens and pseudo-archaeological uh, history documentaries and Fox News. It's no surprise that Tucker Carlson, the Father Coughlin of our modern age, an actual white supremacist who has a huge, the biggest platform on cable news on the streaming platform for Fox is doing episodes of his documentary series on UFO stuff. I even got interviewed by Jose on the topic for a video that he did on Tucker Carlson's streaming videos. So. I'm just gonna put a link to that in the description as well. And Netflix isn't off the hook. Uh, this network that had the first prominent trans television star uh, that changed the game in 2014 is now doing stuff like having specials with Dave Chappelle and hosting things like this documentary. And just one little thing, if you ever wondered 
why Ancient Apocalypse got onto Netflix? How could something this poorly researched and this bad get such a huge red carpet layout from a large corporation? Well, you shouldn't be surprised before, but there is one person that would be good to ask about how all this happened. And that is the person who is the president of unscripted television on Netflix, whose name is... Sean Hancock. Wait, what? Yeah, the president of unscripted television at Netflix is Sean Hancock, Graham Hancock's son. <laughs> I hate this world. No, that's, that's, that's too depressing. We can do better, okay? That's all I wanna say, we can do better. God damn. Well, that was a long one. Hey, if you like this video, you should check out the podcast I do with Scott Nice Wonder of NerdSync called It's Probably Not Aliens, where we debunk the show Ancient Aliens week by week. Furthermore, we talk about UFOs and conspiracies and all sorts of great stuff. I don't want to my own horn, but I think it's very good. You can find the podcast and this channel both on Nebula, so go check that out. I'll see you next time for more Step Back.